welcome to Fairport Flash, the monthly economic update powered by the Fairport Investment Team. Our team gathers the most recent news, data, and research and distills it into the information most important to you. Let's get started. Welcome to another episode of the Fairport Flash. This is Annika Trainer, Digital Marketing Manager, bringing you the latest insights from the Fairport Investment Team. Joining me in the studio today are Chief Investment Officer John Silvis and our very special guest, Neil Dutta, a partner and head of economic research from Renaissance Macro Research. As head of economic research, Neil leads RenMac's macroeconomic research efforts with an emphasis on analyzing the U.S. economy, Federal Reserve, global trends, and cross-market investment themes. Thank you for joining us today, Neil. Thanks for having me on. Hey, Neil. I again appreciate you uh, coming on and, and uh, talking about the economy. Uh, never a dull moment, but uh, I thought before we start talking about where we're at today, kind of go back a little bit. So about this time last year in 2023, most economists were calling for a recession. Somewhere in the middle of 23, um, I would say it was an overwhelming majority of, of uh, your colleagues. But you were, you were kind of one of the outliers. You, d- you didn't really think we'd see a recession. Um, wh- what made you make that call? And, and obviously, it turned out that you were right. Well, thanks for that. Uh, I think uh, a few things. I mean, number one, um, it's important to remember why uh, recession risk rose so much in the first place, and that was because we had a um, big spike in food and energy costs uh, triggered by the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and at the same time, it was aggressively hiking interest rates. I mean, remember, they... um, they at first kind of ruled out 75, then they ended up going 75 basis mm-hmm. points a meeting for several consecutive meetings. So um, that's the time to be very cautious is when uh, you have, um, you know, rising food and energy prices alongside a tightening uh, Fed. And by the end of the year, uh, this is the end of 2022, that was rapidly changing. Remember, by the end of 2022, gasoline prices had basically round tripped uh, to where right. they were to, to start the year. So you went into the new year with a very strong tailwind for household incomes. In other words, inflation was slowing more rapidly than the, uh, the labor markets and that boosted real incomes. And then guess what people did with that money? They went out and spent it. And then, and then, and then earlier uh, in 2023, um, you know, because inflation was coming off because the fed was kind of taking baby steps to the exits, the bond markets kind of, repriced the Fed somewhat, and you had all sorts of people, uh, you know, all sorts of trades being put on with the pause, you know, Fed pause, and you had a rally in the fixed income markets. And that rally in fixed income drove a substantial um, pickup in the housing market, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, you had mortgage rates going from seven to six and a half, and that unlocked a lot of housing market activity. So, that was a big driver for a lot of the concern in 2022, and that kind of went away very quickly uh, in 2023, at least in the early part of 2023. And then finally, um, remember that the government was a substantial tailwind, right? Whether that was state and local government spending and investment, the federal government was uh, boosting GDP growth. So um, you, ha- you, had a, you had a variety of tailwinds out there that kind of kept the economy on even keel. So. That was why I thought recession was unlikely. It really started with the consumer. It's, un, it's unusual to have real incomes expanding and the economy going into recession. So that's why I was sort of surprised about how uh, firm everyone was on the call. And then by you know the third quarter of last year, it was it was clear that the Fed's heart was no longer in it. Right? <laughs> I mean, you know, um, initially they believed that recession was needed to quell inflation, and now they no longer do. And um, and that's a good thing because it's clear that inflation can moderate somewhat without the Fed having to induce a much uh, you know, higher rate of uh, unemployment. So I think that's welcome. And that's, those are sort of the reasons why um, I didn't see a recession. Yeah. Well, no, your, your call was spot on. Uh, so one other thing from 23, and then we'll move into, into, the, future, or into the present here. But we also had a, 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 a little banking hiccup in March of last year. Starting to hear a little bit of conversation, um, uh, was it New York Community Bank they're talking about now with some of the commercial uh, real estate? Do you, do you see that as a hiccup or a, re- a repeat from what we saw last year? Uh, and did that that 
crisis we had in 23, do you think that's worked its way through the economy and it's kind of a, a past event, or is that still lingering? Well, I think banks, I mean, to the extent that it matters, it matters less, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I, I mean, that's sort of, I mean, sequentially, the shock from it is probably abating. Mm -hmm. We know that banks spent much of the last year kind of beefing up their balance sheets, uh, provisioning more for, for, for potential, you know, portfolio losses and so forth. Um, but I think the larger banks in particular, uh, you know, they're provisioning for an unemployment rate that's supposedly going to go up to like 5% by the end of this year. I mean, I, I find that highly implausible. So, you know, we may, we may be at a, in, a, in a situation where they're actually a little bit too cautious on the outlook. And if the unemployment rate doesn't rise as much, then there might be reason uh, for them to loosen lending standards over the course of the year. So I think that that'll be something to watch. And certainly if the Fed's cutting interest rates this year, mm -hmm. that, should, um, that should normalize the, uh, the, the yield curve, right? I mean, if, you, if right. you're assuming, you know, let's say, um, you know, three to four 25 basis point cuts, I mean, that'll probably take care of the, uh, the yield spread. And if the yield spread is positively, positively sloped again, uh, you know, you'd expect to see things like mortgage spreads compress and lending standards ease. So um, that's kind of where I'm at. I mean, I certainly, it's something that we watch. Um, you know, the regional banks uh, have been, uh, you know, sort of a problem um, because of what, what's going on in the commercial real estate markets. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I think the Fed has also shown that it can very quickly deal with um, crises that pop up in the banking system, right? By coming up with some kind of alphabet super program <laughs> to, to basically uh, allow banks to borrow cheap money from the Fed. So, so it's not... It, so, so as we as we uh, get into 2024 here, we're only about six weeks into the year already. But uh, Chairman Powell's been uh, kind of all over the place. So we had the uh, Fed meeting earlier in um, earlier in January. Um, we had the jobs number come out stronger than expected. I think the opposite of last year. Most economists out there now kind of embracing the soft landing scenario uh, as we get into the into what will eventually be some type of rate cut process. But, um, and then, then the biggie was uh, Chairman Powell did his 60 minute uh, comments. Um, so, uh, so maybe take them one by one. What was your thoughts on the job number? They obviously came out stronger. Was that a one off? It looked like the revisions were stronger. Is that just another indication that the economy really is picking up again? I mean, the, the, obviously the third quarter you mentioned was really well. The fourth quarter was, uh, you know, above trend. Um, do you see that continuing, and 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 is uh, is uh, you already mentioned the the unemployment rate, so maybe you already tipped your hand. But do you think those numbers are stronger th stronger for a reason, or was that just kind of an outlier? Um, I mean, I think it's a little bit of both. It, it probably over. I mean, you know, January was a really sloppy month. I mean, you had lots of people out of the job, out of um, you know, normally employed people that weren't at work due to bad weather. So that probably mm -hmm. weighed on things like the work week. So you know, the number, I mean, look, in any, in any month, there's no jobs numbers perfect, right? I mean, even in the best labor markets, you know, folks with a various predisposition disposition can find some nook or cranny in the jobs number to kind of highlight, oh, the birth death model, oh, median duration of employment. I mean, you know, it's like the list goes on and on. But generally speaking, I mean, I think the best way to look at this is just take jobs, the work week, and hourly earnings, mm -hmm. and what does that tell you? And if you look at that number, it's growing at about 5% at an annual rate over the last three months. So that's basically a rough proxy for the labor income that's being, being generated from the labor market, the income for the private sector. That's, that's fine. I mean, that's, that's more than enough to keep you know, consumer spending on sort of an even keel. But I think you, know, you mentioned that the markets are kind of embracing the consensus. You know, I think that's, I, you know, I think um, the markets are sort of embracing the soft landing. Now that's become the consensus. But keep mm -hmm. in mind, I mean, there's a, a lot of upside to GDP growth expectations uh, for the consensus. Um, you know, if you look at, I'll, I'll tell you, like I'm looking at my Bloomberg screen right now. This is Q1 of this year through Q4 of this year. Annual rates for real GDP growth in the U.S. 1.5, 1, 1.5. 1, 1. I mean, so... 
The consensus doesn't see growth stronger than 1.5% at an annual rate in any of the next four quarters. I mean, think about that for a second. That is absurdly weak, especially considering the, you know, if you look at Nowcast for the first quarter, I mean, if you believe the Atlanta Fed, we're north of three and a half. Right. So right. It's, it's a little bit, um, you know, I, I think people are getting caught off sides on growth. Now, does that mean that the Fed is going to be hawkish? Well, at the margin, yes, but I don't think that stops rate cuts from happening. I mean, one, one of the ways, um, you know, I think what's going on is that the consensus is underestimating productivity growth. Right. I mean, th this is typically what happens when productivity is growing is that the consensus has an, a habit of going into the year very, very cautious on growth. And by, as by the time the year's over, they have you know, revised up their expectations quite rapidly. This is, this is like something that was happening in the 90s also. Um, now, it, may be, it might be too soon to tell whether that's the case here, but clearly people have underestimated productivity, which is why inflation has been falling more rapidly than people have thought, even with the strong growth. And um, and I think that there's some room for that to continue. I mean, um, you know, growth is okay. I kind of assume that it's going to be something around two to two and a half percent. Um, but I think inflation is continuing to moderate, and I think the markets have kind of lost sight of that um, recently. But you know, when you look at things like used car prices, those are coming down. Shelter prices, those are coming down. That's going to matter for core inflation. And um, and the Fed can only ignore that for so long. So this is one of the reasons why I've said, like, even if they don't hike in March, uh, cut in March, sorry, they'll probably use March to set up a cut later. I mean, they're going to be, but the threshold is the bar is very, very high for them not to cut, um, you so, know, before June. So I, I want to go back to the, the rate cut scenario, but uh, you mentioned something. You, you mentioned the 90s, and then you mentioned productivity. So, um you know, it's, you'd have to be under a rock not to hear people talk about AI or artificial intelligence and, and how that's the new economic boom. I've heard it compared to the Internet, um, you know, Internet taking off in the, in the mid-90s. Uh, do, do you think, I mean, is, is that an economic boom? Is that going to be the next productivity driver? I mean, it, it, it could be, but I would just say that that's probably not the reason why productivity is picking up right now. Okay. Right? I mean, okay. um, I think – I mean, there's the uh, the old so the clip about the sol the solo paradox, right? I mean, productivity is everywhere except for the economic statistics, right? So my experience is that typically when you see these things happening around you, that's not when the peak productivity shows up in the economic data because it takes time for people to learn and understand and extract the most value out of all the new technologies that are out there. So if it's AI, I mean, we're not going to notice that until maybe a few, few years from now. I think um, I think what's driving the productivity right now is something a little bit more uh, simplistic, which is that people aren't quitting their jobs to the same degree they were a year ago, right? I mean, if, yeah. if someone's quitting, if, if someone is quitting their jobs every two months in search of a new one that's paying them more, I mean, how can you establish labor productivity in that environment? You have to actually keep the seat warm in order to <laughs> um, to get productive in the job, right? Yeah, I mean, no, that's uh, a good point. Good and point. so I think I think now that that's happening, um, it's uh, it's 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 probably providing some dividend for productivity. And I think we're getting a little bit more used to our working from home arrangements and so forth. And maybe that's providing some tailwind for productivity. Although you know th there could be some kind of a mix shift there where you're kind of driving up the productivity of like. Uh, you know, more mid-level and somewhat more experienced workers at the, at the you know, uh, cost to sort of lower skilled, you know, or, or newer workers, right? Because I think being in the office definitely helps younger workers more right. than, 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 than uh, you know, middle-aged or older workers. But, but, I mean, but generally speaking, I think it's because people haven't been putting their jobs as much and, you know, they're kind of occupying their roles for a longer period of time. And that's, that's bound to have some effects on productivity in a positive way. So you, um, so you mentioned uh, the rates. Um, I guess before we get into that, you know, the CPI or the, the consumer price index came out uh, recently. Uh, I know the Fed looks at PCE, which is um, personal consumption expenditure. Uh, a little different, but it seems like the three and six month numbers, if you just take those and, and annualize them, are definitely trending towards that below two percent, which I think is where the Fed wants to go. 
do you you think it's been rumored or the Fed looks at those more than they look at the the um, the twelve month annualized numbers? So do you think are going back to when the the Fed cut comes? It seems like Chairman Powell ruled out March, and he pretty much said that during the the sixty minute in interview. Although you did say in one of your in your piece uh, earlier this week that it's not totally out of the question, but it seems unlikely. I look today. Well, yeah, 20%. I mean, for me, it was as you know, uh, John. It was it was my base case earlier, mm-hmm. and we kind of stuck our neck out neck out at the end of the of last year on right. on March, and it was working out pretty well until Powell had to go open his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, but look, I mean, I would just say the data is already there. Do you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? I mean, the yeah. data is already there by his own admission, because he's not even. I mean. Inflation over the last three months on core PCE is 1.5% at an annual rate for the last right. three months. For the last six, it's 1.9. Right. Okay, so basically we've it's been, there. We've, yeah, the data are cooperating. The only, I mean, they're not even, I mean, at the margin, they've become somewhat less data dependent. They're just time dependent. Like March feels too soon. You know, it's not, mm-hmm. it's not the data. It's just, it, it's a little too soon. That's all. That's all he's saying. Like he wants to wait, right? you know, because he wants to take out some insurance on the prospect of inflation kicking back up again. I think the problem with that logic, quite frankly, is that if inflation were to kick back up, you wouldn't know it even by May. I mean, it, like there's still, because there's such a pipeline of disinflation from things like rent, it's too soon to even think about it popping back up. So, so is that the one rate, thing think, holding things back? The, the rent number that you hear left that that uh, owners equivalent rent a lot and it's kind of it I guess it's showing up some places but it takes longer to, to percolate through the, the I don't official think numbers it's that. I think no I think what's holding them back frankly is the economy is growing really strongly in real okay. terms that's what's holding them back it's not you know it's not the inflation data I mean in other words if you were being you Alfred, make, Alfred Miller right is could, that the idea you could you, you, you could make the argument now that at some level, maybe the Fed put it back, right? Because it wouldn't take a lot in terms of growth weakness mm-hmm. or uh, financial condition tightening for the Fed to come in and start cutting because they've basically achieved their inflation goals um, by their own admission. Like, all they're really saying is, like, we're, get, we're confident. We just need to get a little more confident. I mean, it's, like, it's very vague and opaque by design. So, you know, he hasn't even said, I mean, Powell's even said that inflation doesn't actually need to get better. We just need to see more or less more of the same. And um, and so, you know, look, as I said, I mean, but I mean, there could be a big downside surprise in the inflation data at some right. point in the next two months. And, you know, the, the, the market could be, I mean, pricing, you know, maybe a 40 percent chance of a March cut by then. I mean, it's, it's hard to know. Um, right. That's, that's why I say you can't rule it out completely. But I do think that we're probably going to see some recalibration of policy this year. And I think yeah. the big story is whether that comes in May or June um, or March, um, you're not, you, have, you have sort of a ceiling on how many cuts the Fed will do. I don't think it will be, frankly, more than four. So the dot uh, plots ta- earlier said six, right? And then uh, you know March – Two weeks ago, March was eighty percent. Now I think it's twenty percent. But do you, so, do you think it's a later start and probably three to three to five? Th- but six is probably unlikely at this point. The cuts. Yeah, I mean, if, if I look at if I look at the, the futures market, uh, mm-hmm. the futures market at the moment is coming more into line with the uh, the Fed's dots. I mean, the yeah. Fed currently sees um, the you know three cuts, and the market's at five now. Uh, you know, I, I think um, I think they I, I could see a scenario where the Fed is penciling in an additional cut this year uh, because I think inflation's slowing a little bit more quickly than they think. But keep in mind that you know the bond market is always going to see more rate cuts than whatever the Fed is projecting because bond traders have a habit of you know it's just the hedging story, right? You're basically you need to hedge against the risk of a big slowdown. Mm-hmm. And if, they, if there's um, if there's a recession, then obviously the Fed is going to be going more. So your modal outcome might be three, your baseline, mm-hmm. but it's the tail risks that drive those expectations. You know, if it looks like five cuts, six cuts, or whatever. So if the Fed ends up going three or four times, I mean, you still expect the bond market to be pricing in 
five. And as we get closer to those meetings, those expectations will get priced out. So, so, um, so looking forward, and, and you said uh, earlier, you know, you can never rule things out. So if, if there was like one signal out there that would maybe change your mind that, hey, maybe the recession is a, a, high, a higher probability than I'm thinking. I know credit card delinquencies have, have perked up here. I saw a headline recently. Um, I know your colleague Jeff DeGraff talks about credit spreads, and they seem to be pretty solid so far. But um, do you keep an eye on credit? generally speaking, and then the delinquencies and, you know, um, uh, non-performing loans and those things, is is that kind of the canary in the coal mine? Well, I know people are talking about it a lot. Um, you know, I would, I mean, I would say a couple things with respect to credit. I mean, obviously, during the pandemic, you had a lot of people getting credit, right? Mm-hmm. And um, in it was many easy cases, to get. yeah, and during that time also, you had a lot of people moving up the credit ladder right? Like formerly subprime folks moving into higher tiers, right? Like, mm-hmm. so that credit step up process means that the pool of subprime at the margin is less credit worthy. So the delinquency rates have spiked for subprime borrowers because uh, a lot of the better subprime borrowers have moved up in some respects, the credit chain, right? So in some respects, I would say the delinquency rates for subprime is, is overstated a little bit. Okay. Um, the, the, uh, I mean, it overstates the magnitude of the problem for that reason. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, look, I mean, I think credit historically is something that's episodic, right? I mean, if the economy is slowing and employment is, is, is declining, then credit becomes a big problem that accelerates the downturn. But if that's not the case, then it's, it'll be, it'll be okay. And the last thing I would say is that you do have this sort of interesting thing where, because mortgage rates have been so low and people are locked in at like sub 3% paper on their 30 years, they're, they're prioritizing paying those off. Right. Then their cars. Right. right. I'm in that, I'm in that camp myself. So, (laughs) so, um, I guess I know this is not your area expertise. Uh, your colleague, Steve Pavlik covers, uh, you know, policy and politics, but we do have an election coming up. Um, and I know China seems to be always on people's minds. They, you know, they, they were very slow, as, as, as you know, to uh, reopen after the pandemic. And everybody thought there would be a kind of a bump there. And it hasn't really materialized. And then we're starting to, you know, you hear more and more companies reshoring those jobs or bringing them back home or however you want to term that. Um, did, just maybe from the global economy perspective, is, is China kind of a – a declining factor out there? Uh, I mean, I think at the margin, yes, a lot of final assemblies already leaked out of China. Mm-hmm. And um, and it's not having as much of an effect on the global economy. Frankly, not even the regional economy. And if, if you look at um, some of the EN Asia economies, they're doing fine, even though China is a mess. Right. I mean, like if you look at activity from South Korea or Vietnam, you know, exports, Taiwan, even I mean, their export numbers are looking better, uh, even as China is looking somewhat worse. Uh, Certainly, India has has kind of taken up some of the Mm -hmm. slack in that part of the world also. Um, So, uh, you know, do I think China is a problem for global growth? Yes, but it's not. It's not the catastrophe that it was like in 2016, 2017. I mean, that you're not talking about a scenario where the Fed's going to be backing off because China's devaluing their currency or anything like that. I mean, that was sort of the 2015, um, you know, that happened back in 2015. So, you know, I, um, I think it matters a lot for Europe, right? I mean, the mm-hmm. fact that China kind of emerged as this, as this big auto producer, that's kind of taken a lot of the uh, – the air out of out of Germans, uh, the European manufacturing base, particularly in Germany, um, and so I think it's had much more of an effect on 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 the Europeans and Germany, frankly, than it has on the U.S. So one other uh, one other thing on politics, and then uh, we can move on. But uh, you know, it looks like the general election has been kind of set, and you know, for. Four years ago, all you heard about was tariffs, and then we haven't heard much about tariffs in the last couple of years. But I've heard that um, that term pop up again. D- does that have an, a long term effect on the economy, or has it since we? Because I, I don't believe we've rolled any of those back. And is it just kind of 
something the economy has absorbed, or is that something that will be a, a hindrance going forward if we actually do see more tariffs on China coming uh, after the election? Well, at the margin, if you have more tariffs on China, you'll probably leak final assembly away from China. Okay. It doesn't necessarily mean that you'll be leaking that activity back to the U.S. I mean, in my work, what you've seen is, you know, whenever you have these big tariff announcements, usually what you see is countries like Mexico benefiting, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. um, so 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 it's not necessarily that uh, that the activity spills back into the U.S. And certainly it would be inflationary for U.S. consumers at right. the margin. Right. Um, you know, but I don't, I mean, I, I always think that trade generally I think has, I mean, there's no, there's no law in economics that says like trade has to grow at some sort of exponential rate relative to GDP. You know, I mean, back, back in the, um, in the nineties, early two thousands, I mean, trade volumes were growing about twice as quickly as global GDP. And, um, and now it's basically one for one and that's, that's okay. I mean, it's, um, it's, it's probably a modest headwind. I mean, I, but I don't. I don't think that there's some kind of rule that says that trade has to be growing at some sort of, you know, exponential rate relative to GDP. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of. I think it's something that's been probably uh, dramatically oversold in terms of what it means for the economy. Um, doesn't mean that tariffs are good, but. You know, I wouldn't be, I mean, let's see what happens. I mean, I just, I wouldn't be lighting my hair on fire because of tariffs. I mean, <laughs> right. obviously, lots of things can happen. I mean, if, if you recall back in the, um, you know, back during the Trump uh, presidency, you know, what what happened? I mean, it was sort of a, a love-hate relationship with the markets and Trump, right? I mean, the first, uh, you know, year of his presidency was sort of a love fest, right? Because he right. was doing all sorts of things to stimulate the economy, provide relief for companies, uh, corporate tax reform and so forth, lowering the rates, broadening the, you know, all all sorts Mm -hmm. of things that companies said they wanted. And then, you know, basically Trump, by his own admission, he said, like, look, now I'm playing with the house money. So basically Mm -hmm. companies got this huge tailwind for their margins and then the tariff uh, thing started. Um, And, uh, you know, look, I mean, I think um, we have to kind of wait and see. the uh, the headlines that you see probably aren't what will end up happening, but I do expect kind of a hawkish sort of approach with with China, and um, and tariffs will probably be one way that they deal with that. Um, yeah. So so we're we're almost done on time, but a couple of just kind of quick questions, uh, more sure. predictions. So CPI, do you think we get a two handle on it before the end of the year? I mean, we're pretty close already, but. Th- yeah, I mean, I think certainly PCE will have a two-handle on it. I mean, I think the Fed will be revising down their inflation forecast in March again. Okay. Um, so, yes, I, I think so. Okay. Yeah. And so far – I mean, it, I, one thing I would point out, it is important for viewers to know that there is a disc- – I mean, remember, like, the Fed looks at PCE. Right. And the CPI number is also important. That's released earlier in the data cycle. But the reason the Fed focuses on PCE, one of the reasons is because it's a wider scope of things. Right. Like, mm-hmm. so the CPI only measures out of pocket expenses. The PCE also measures payments made on behalf of individuals, as an example, like education. Right. Like those payments are being made on, be- on behalf of people by their local school districts and so forth. Or your health insurance. Right. Health insurance is made by, in many cases, third party payment. Mm-hmm. That's not included in CPI. Um, and so that's why the Fed looks at PCE versus CPI. And uh, PCE, for that reason, I think, is because it has a wider scope, it means that, um, you know, some of the areas are going to look a little bit um, more sluggish. I mean, healthcare is a good example. I mean, healthcare inflation in PCE is likely to run much lower than healthcare inflation in CPI. And for that reason, it's, it's probable that PCE converges on to 2% uh, more quickly than CPI does. So, so my last question. Um a little tongue in cheek here, but so what's going to have a bigger influence on uh, the 2024 economy, the uh, 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 artificial intelligence or Taylor Swift? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, well, on the 2024 <laughs> economy, I would, I mean, it depends. Let's, I mean, we got the Super Bowl coming up next right. week. If, well, Travis, if the Chiefs are able to pull it out and uh, 
he gets on bended knee and proposes to her right there on the field. That, that could do it. Uh, That's 2% probably, right there. You probably get a baby boom in the U.S. starting <laughs> at some point in 2025. So. Okay. I have, all right. Well, hey, Neil, I really appreciate the time. Um, this has really been insightful. Uh, you know, our clients and, and uh, the viewers will really appreciate this. I appreciate the time you, you have, and, um, you know, best of luck to you guys th- between now and the end of the year, and uh, we'll keep in touch. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank appreciate you very much. It. Yep. And that concludes another episode of the Fairport Flash. Thank you again to Neil for being on the show today and for sharing your thoughts and insight. As always, if you have any questions on the topics discussed today, please don't hesitate to reach out to a member of your Fairport Wealth team. For the latest updates from our investment team, follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter, and look for the hashtag Investing with Fairport. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. Fairport is a group of investment professionals registered with Hightower Securities, LLC, a member of FINRA and SIPC, and with Hightower Advisors, LLC, a registered investment advisor with the SEC. Securities are offered through Hightower Securities, LLC. Advisory services are offered through Hightower Advisors, LLC. This is not an offer to buy or sell securities. No investment process is free of risk, and there's no guarantee that the investment process or the investment opportunities referenced herein will be profitable. Past performance is not indicative of current or future performance and is not a guarantee. The investment opportunities referenced herein may not be suitable for all investors. All data and information referenced herein are from sources believed to be reliable. Any opinion, news, research, analysis, prices, or other information contained in the research is provided as a general market commentary. It does not constitute as investment advice. Airport and Hightower shall not be in any way liable for claims and make no express or implied representations or warranties as to the accuracy or completeness of the data and other information, or for statements and errors contained in or omissions from the obtained data and information referenced herein. The data and information are provided as of the date referenced. Such data and information are subject to change without notice. This document was created for informational purposes only. The opinions expressed are solely those of Fairport and do not represent those of Hightower Advisors, LLC, or any of its affiliates.